Today, our plan is to learn about the last two steps of uh, covenant making. Um, we're going to talk about Job's, co Job's covenant. And we're going to talk about four more hindrances to receiving healing to see if we can get rid of these hindrances so we can walk in freedom. That's the plan, but I'm not sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever we do, we do. <laughs> Our precious Heavenly Father, we come this morning into your presence praising you, thanking you, Lord, for everything that you have done for us, that you are doing to us. But I give you praise for what you will be doing to us and through us. Father, help us to be the women of God that you want us to be, Father. Be, help us to be your hands extended. Help us to be your feet. Help us to be your ears. Help us to be your mouth sharing out whatever, Lord, your Holy Spirit wants to share with whomever we have the opportunity to meet. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for this privilege of, of coming together in prayer. I pray, Lord, that you open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. You're the teacher. Uh, thank you, and I praise you for Cindy as being our facilitator. But Lord God, I pray you talk through her and then you help her to, to get across the lesson that you have for us. And Lord Jesus, and those that not only hear, but those that will be listening to um, this video and will be learning as well. Lord, I thank you for this privilege of going out and touching many hearts, many lives, just not the ones that we are fortunate to be able to be here. But Lord God, I pray that you bless this class and help it to go forth lord and and have bear much fruit bear much fruit yes. lord in the lives of those that will yes. listen so heavenly father i pray you be with those that are not here for whatever reason it would be a good reason or they would be here so father i pray that now you fill this room you we you said in your word lord for two or more gather together there you are in the midst so, Father, we are gathered together, and we yeah. pray your, your presence here. Holy Spirit, come. Yes. Come and fill this room. Fill our hearts. Fill our minds. And, Father, we give you praise for what you're going to do and teach through Cindy, but to us this mm -hmm. morning in Jesus' mighty name. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. Amen. Matthew 13. We're going to read our um, opening scriptures again. We're going to start with uh, verse 10. Go through 21 this time. Then the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he replied to them, To you it has been given to know the secrets and mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has spiritual knowledge to him will more be given, and he will be furnished richly so that he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is the reason that I speak to them in parables, because having the power of seeing, they do not see. Having the power of hearing, they do not hear, nor do they grasp and understand. In them, indeed, is the process of fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, You shall indeed hear and hear, but never grasp and understand. And you shall indeed look and look, but never see and perceive. For this nation's heart has grown gross or fat and dull and their ears heavy and difficult of hearing, and their eyes they have clo tightly closed, lest they see and perceive with their eyes and hear and comprehend the sense with their ears and grasp and understand with their heart and turn, and I should heal them. But blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied are your eyes because they do see and your ears because they do hear. Truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous men who were upright and in right standing with God, yearn to see what you see and did not see and to hear what you hear and did not hear. Listen to the meaning of the parable of the sower. While anyone is hearing the word of God, the kingdom, and does not grasp and comprehend it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the roadside. As for that was sown on thin or rocky soil, this is he who hears the word and at once welcomes and accepts it with joy. Yet it has no real root in him, but is temporary, inconstant, lasts but a little while. And when affliction or trouble or persecution, persecution comes on account of the word, notice that phrase, persecution mm -hmm. comes on account of the word, at once he is caused to stumble. 
He is repelled and begins to distrust and desert him whom he ought to trust and obey. And he falls away. I'm not going to um, go on with the rest of that. I just wanted to make up this point that notice the different kinds of hearers. We're going to focus on the second one there. The ones where the, the seed was sown on rocky soil. They don't have deep roots because you can't get roots through the rocks. They read the word, but they don't, but they focus on the world. They read the word, but focus on the world. When persecution becomes because of the word they hear, heard, they can't stay strong because they have no word in them to rely on. But that is not us. I noticed something a long time ago, and <laughs> it's as close as I get to swearing. <laughs> I don't say things, but if you notice the word, word is spelled W-O-R-D, right? Word. And world is spelled W-O-R-L-D. Get the L out and focus on the word. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> That's cute. That's as close as I'm going to get. Okay, so on your uh, assignment sheet at the top, let's read our, our uh, statement of faith here. Ready? Read. My, My spiritual, spiritual ears are blessed to hear. My spiritual eyes are blessed to see. I understand the word I hear. I am healed. Praise Amen. God. I felt the power in that one that time. It's getting there, isn't it? <laughs> yes. All right. Let's review the first steps to making covenant. Because as we said, covenant, understanding covenant and knowing your covenant is one of the major hindrances for people to not receiving their healing. So the first step is usually pre-ceremony actions. That's where the terms and the conditions and the cursings and the blessings were agreed upon. Mm -hmm. As I said, there is a cost to entering into this covenant with God. There's a cost to receiving your healing. The second step was the selection of two covenant representatives and cutting the sacrifice. And we said that Jesus represents both of the representatives and he is the sacrifice and the mediator. He did it all. The third step is the exchange. That's where they frequently would exchange their robes or belts or weapons or some other symbol. And the purpose was to show that we are one. We are no longer independent. It says, I give you all that I have and you give me all that you are. It signifies a new position, a new character, a new authority. The fourth step is the walk unto death. The representatives would each walk around the set pieces of the sacrificed the animal. Sacrifice. And they would look at each other and say, uh, do so to me as has been done to this animal if I break this covenant. If I fail to keep this covenant, may I die even as this animal has died. We don't have to die. Jesus did all the dying that's going to be done. Uh, but this is so important that we understand this is not a breakable covenant uh, except by death. There is no, uh, we can't break this covenant. It's between Jesus and God. We're sharing in it. We, we are joint heirs with Jesus in it. The fifth step is the pronouncement of the blessings and cursings. And during the ancient ceremonies, the two representatives would stand in the middle of the sacrifice and speak aloud the terms of the covenant. In the assignment, uh, it was Deuteronomy, what, 27 to 32, yeah. Moses placed half of the, the tribes on one mountain and the other half on the other mountain, and then he was in the middle. So you could hear the, the one side was pronouncing the blessing, one side was pronouncing the curses. There's a song that we sang on Sunday, I'm Trading My Sorrows. Mm -hmm. There's one line in it and it says, I'm blessed beyond the curse for his promise will endure. We are blessed beyond the curse. Mm -hmm. So what I did this week is I went through those five chapters and I listed out, yeah, I did it. I'm kind of like that, you know. <laughs> So on one side wow. of this handout is all the blessings on, on here. Wow. And then on this side is the curses and here. That's how many curses were pronounced. Three columns worth of curses, curses. one column of blessings. There were a lot, but I did. I, when you read yeah. them, yeah, but you, to put them that way, that's yeah. startling. Mm -hmm. 
I put some of them that stood out to me in red. Thank For instance, you. the first one in red is all these curses will come on you to overtake you. Jesus bore all of our curses. So that's the first one. Then down here, some of these, I well, I got these out of the Amplified, so I guess it makes sense. But the next one was confusion. So um, confusion, if you think medically, is that like dementia, Alzheimer's? Could be, that kind sure. Of, could be? Yeah, it would be a type of, yeah. Dementia. So don't say I'm confused. No. It's under the curse. Jesus bore your confusion. Pestilence, what do we think that could, because it says pestilence clings to you to consume you. Is that like COVID? That would be COVID. That's COVID? And whatever else they're trying to put whatever on us? Whatever they're trying to put on us, yeah. yes. Mm. Okay, what is consumption with fever TB. and inflammation? TB? T a tuberculosis. tuberculosis. That's what they used to call tel uh, TB years ago. My grandfather had consumption. Consumption, okay. Yeah, that's TB. So that's under the curse. Fever, mm -hmm. any kind of fever. Any kind of fever. Inflammation, isn't that arthritis? Yes. Of the joints, inflammation? Mm -hmm. Okay, what's fiery heat? Fever. That, oh, that's a fever? Okay. Wouldn't it be? Fiery heat would be Fiery excessive heat. fever. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, boils. That's like a skin problem, oh, yeah. or is it? Oh, okay. yeah. Big boils. Big boils. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Tumors. Mm. Tumors. We know what those are. Mm -hmm. It's under the curse. What's scurvy? Lack of vitamin C. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your, miss your body is missing nutrients. Mm -hmm. and, and it breaks out. It's okay. scurvy's nasty. It's just a terrible itch. Okay. And, but so that's under the curse. The itch that cannot be healed. An that itch. can be, yes, that can be nerve itch. Oh, yeah. And nerves, yeah, ner the, ner oh boy, do they neuropathy? itch. Yeah. Okay. Part of neuropathy, but it, okay. the itch can be, it's, it's by the nerve endings. Okay, so your nerves. And there's a scripture in Proverbs that says that his word is health to our nerves. Mm. Madness. Mm. Now, that's not the same as dementia or no. this is something else. That's uh, when people, they used to say people, schizophrenia. schizophrenia. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, good. Yeah. Bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. all of these different, and, and I think we could probably put under there the results. What, what do you think about the results of drug uh, damage, oh, brain damage? Brain damage, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having to do with drugs or alcohol. There is a, there is a dementia that comes also with excessive wow. alcohol. So any type of drug um, damage would would probably fall under okay madness blindness how about that that's under the curse mm -hmm. jesus said blessed are your eyes and uh, let's see i'm just gonna skim okay so then on the next column it says all these curses will come on you and pursue you and overtake you but not us because we're following jesus mm -hmm. long as we're we're following him. These will not come on us. We, you will be in want of everything. That means no lack. What does it say in Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall, shall not, not lack. lack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great plagues of long continuous. Plagues. Um, what is the black? Oh, uh, the bubonic. Plague, bubonic. Bubonic plague. What about a, a yellow fever? Would that oh, be a plague? It could fever. be. Okay. Yeah. Grievous sickness of long duration. Could that be like a cold? That could be cancer. That could be cancer. Mm -hmm. Grievous okay. sickness of long duration. Okay. Yeah, that that would be a cold. And no, not a cold. I don't no. think so. That cold you can oh, get. Oh, short duration. They're short. That's short okay. duration. This okay. is long duration. So this would be something that would require long treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of which basically, it's everything. Would almost be. Arthritis. I mean, oh, I, yeah. we, we mentioned that, but people yeah. go for arthritis. They go for um, any kind of um, nerve disorder, urinary tract, um, mm -hmm. gut problem, mm -hmm. long duration. It could be any of that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Colitis. Colitis, yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Crohn's disease. Crohn's. Yeah. I was just thinking mm -hmm. that one. I was trying to think what Heart it was disease. called. Heart mm disease. -hmm. Heart disease, yeah. yeah. Lung disease. All the diseases of Egypt that you were afraid of will cling to you. Every sickness, every affliction not written in this law. That includes everything because everything it would be everything that's in the future that they didn't even know about. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't know about COVID. <laughs> mm -hmm. no? Trembling heart, failing eyes, fainting mind. So, I mean, there's a whole 
huge There's list your of things. Arrhythmias, heart arrhythmias. Heart arrhythmias. Yeah, where there is a, a, a disruption in how the heart is beating. AFib. AFib, ventricular fibrillation. Yeah. Well, praise God, I am blessed beyond the curse. Absolutely. His promise endures. None of these things have any right to stay in us. They may come on us. Symptoms may come on us. They may be lying symptoms even that come on us. But if you know your covenant, you can stand on that covenant. The sixth one was the seal of the covenant mark. During ancient ceremonies, the agreement would be signed with a, sealed with a sign like circumcision or like the wedding ring for marriage. The last two steps, the exchange of names. Exchanging names implies exchanging personality, character, reputation, authority. It's like in mm -hmm. marriage, it symbols like two becoming one. The more, the longer you're married, the more you become like each other. Mm -hmm. The more you know that person. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the Old Testament, God changed Abraham, Abram's and Sarai's names. He actually added his name to the middle of their names. He put himself in the middle of them. They, they had a covenant with God. So he gave them, God gave them his name. Oh, get to how you. did he do that? He put the H in it. The, the H. Hem, the, the, uh, what is it called? Hey? It's, it's the letter that it, it refers to God. It refers to God. Yeah, so and they Abraham, put it in their name. Because he was Abram. Sarah, right. Yeah, but With he was H. Abram. Right. And then Abraham. Ha the H was H right in the middle yes. of his name. It's at the end of. But the, this is anglicized, too. So. Well, I know it's but, anglicized. It has to be, but Sarah. Yeah. Because it was Sari. That's right. And yeah. then Sarah. You put that, that whatever that symbol the, was. Well, I forgot to look it up. the symbol of. Yeah, the Hebrew language, the Hebrew. Yeah, the H, whatever. Ha, he, he. So he put he put his name in their names. In the New Testament, we get to use all of the Hebrew names of God, like Jehovah Rapha, God my healer. Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. Can you think of any other Jehovahs? Healer. <laughs> yep, Jehovah Rapha. Yeah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah. Tits can you for the banner the uh Under banner yeah jehovah yeah shama Shh. no that's not yeah the lord my banner the lord my victory yeah yeah the lord who's already there there are so many names of god in the hebrew uh, that we have access to to and they describe his character right that's what we're talking about here this Exchanging the names Im implies exchanging character. Now, because of the new covenant, we have Jesus's authority, we have Jesus's power, and we have Jesus's name. We can ask anything in the name of Yeshua, Jesus. Anything. Jesus promised it. It's one of the blessings of the co of the covenant that we have. Better, better promises. It says. We have better promises than what they had, better blessings. The eighth and final step is the covenant meal. It was a celebration meal. It included bread and wine, which represents the body and blood of the covenant partners. As they celebrated, they made declarations to live as one. They were expressing their vows to live for each other. From now on, these two are one. In the Old Testament, we see in Genesis 18, this is when Abraham was in his tent, at his tent door or whatever, um, and the three visitors came to visit him. Mm -hmm. And those three visitors were God. Could have been, I don't know. I, I'm just saying it could have been since there was three. It could have been the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, you know, could have been. Could have been. We don't know it because it doesn't say. But this is where the covenant meal came in with Abraham in verses 5 through 10. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you have said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, hurry. Get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough, and bake some bread. Then Abraham ran out to the herd and chose a tender calf 
and gave it to his servant who quickly prepared it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and the roasted meat and he served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. So there was a promise there and there was a meal that was prepared. In the, in the uh, New Testament, it's communion. And we've already discussed that in the last session, uh, week three. We talked all about the covenant meal of communion, so we're not going to go through that today. We are going to move on to the next covenant, which is Job's. And I didn't know until I started doing this study, Job has a covenant. So we're going to go to the book of Job. Job, throughout um, this book, he was in self-pity because one reason... He wasn't standing on the covenant that he had between him and God. He had no faith in his covenant. If you have no faith in your covenant for healing, the covenant that we have right now, you can get into self-pity. And as we'll see later on, that is not pleasing to God. He kept making burnt offer offerings, which meant he was under a covenant set with God. It says in Job 1, Verse 5, And so it was when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. He had no faith in the sacrifice. He had no faith in his covenant. He had no faith in his children. <laughs> Uh, this is this is about where the, his sons and daughters would um, go to each other's house and they would eat and drink and have lots of parties. And, and he wanted to make sure that they weren't sinning against God. Job's covenant was a life-protecting covenant. Satan wanted God to touch all he had. But God said, he's already in your, your power, but don't touch him. Mm -hmm. Right then, Satan found out that he had authority over Job. But God doesn't break his covenant. His covenant was a life-protecting covenant. It's not the covenant like we have. Okay, So don't try to equate this to what we have. This is what Job had. When, when the pressure came on Job, God told the devil, don't touch his life. And for nine months and 40 chapters, not once did Job mention his covenant with God. All he talked about was, poor me. God did not change his covenant over Job as being upright. Let's look at Job ver uh, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. This is right. Satan talking here. All right, you may test him, the Lord says to Satan. Do whatever you want with uh, his possessions, but don't harm. Well, 12 is all right, you may test him. Um, right. 11 is, but reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want um, with what he possesses, but don't harm him physically. Yeah. So Satan left the Lord's presence. There we go. Don't touch him. Mm -hmm. You can't touch him. You can touch his possessions, but you can't touch him. So it's a life-saving covenant that he had between Job and himself. When you hear everything that happened to Job, mm -hmm. he was human. Yeah. He was a human man. He never turned his back on God. Mm -hmm. But when he lost his home, he lost his, most importantly, he lost his children. Mm -hmm. No, he didn't lose his wife, did he? No. Mm -hmm. uh -uh, he didn't lose his just wife. Just his children. He just, but he lost all of his children. A tornado came and, mm -hmm. and then he lost all of his livestock. He lost everything that he owned. The only thing he had left was his wife who literally in time turned on him. Why don't you curse God and die? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I'm... <laughs> no, but I mean, you can see the human side of him. Oh, well, yes, you can, but we're going to show you how to yeah. overcome this one. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. 
Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Wow, I like the way yours says that. <laughs> I mean, that that just really says it. This is God talking to, to Job. Oh, mm -hmm. um, in one version, it says that God said, Would you disannul my decision to make covenant with you? Who made the decision to do the covenant? Not Job. It was God. Mm -hmm. God coming to Job and said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. But his speaking, what he said, got him in trouble. All right, well, we'll, co we'll come back to that in a second. I want to go on to verses, uh, let's see, Job 40, verse, verse 15. Take a look at behemoth, which I made just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. In my Bible, I don't know about in yours, there's a little uh, letter, it's an M for me, which means I go down to the bottom of my page, and it says, Behemoth is an elephant. It says a sea monster. A line. sea monster in your <laughs> Okay. All right, this one says it's an elephant. It says, okay. It's disputed. The identification of Behemoth is disputed, ranging from an earthly creature to a mythical sea monster in ancient literature. Yeah. I don't think God is going to do an, a mythical anything. It's going to be <laughs> real. Let's look at Job 41, verse 1. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? On mine, Leviathan is a whale or a whirlpool. A whale. So it's huge, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then verse four. Will it agree to work for you to be your slave for life? Okay. In the King James, it says, will he make a covenant yeah. with you? That's what mine mm. says. With, some, yes. with a huge, huge animal yeah. make a covenant with you? Um, one version even calls this animal a crocodile. Will a crocodile or an elephant make a covenant with you? So he had a covenant. Job had a covenant. It's right there. Chapter 40, verse 7. Gird up your loins now like a man. So God is saying, get dressed like a man. And then he says, I will demand of you and you declare to me. That is part of covenant. I make this declaration. You make this declaration. I'm demanding this of you. You demand this of me. It's part of covenant. So he's saying, uh, let's see, I'm going to declare or demand of you and I want you to demand of me. Stop self-pity. You never get anything from God with it. He doesn't dare agree with you. If he did, he'd become a declaring witness and Satan could kill you. If you can't stand before an elephant, you can't stand before a huge God. You have a covenant with God. You have the right to make declarations based on this covenant that you have from God. And we just read right here, these black, these curses. I demand that these curses have no effect on me. Let's see, Job 42, 42 verses one through four. Okay. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no thought could be withholden from you. Who is he that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech you and I will speak. I will demand of you and declare you unto me. There it is right there. I will demand of you. What? We're going to demand God? Yes, we are. He made promises as a covenant uh, agreement between us. Do you see how important covenant, covenant making is mm -hmm. now? You have the right to make demands of God, just like he has rights to make demands of you. You have become one. When you do, it's not like you're being belligerent. You're not, you're just, you're standing on the agreement that you have with God. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Yeah. I take back everything <laughs> I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Yeah, I love <laughs> but that it. is I so love good. It. Isn't yeah. that good? Yeah. Because he had only heard of God before. Now he sees him. And sometimes people only hear of God, but they don't really know him because they have never seen him per se. And then once they have, 
then everything changes. Their whole perspective changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and they get out of, I mean, I was saying he was very human when all that happened. Yeah. He'd only heard of God. That's right. So the human man was kind of, you know, I've lost everything. But now he's saying, I see you. He sees and I him take as all covenant. that back. Yeah. He sees he him sees, as a covenant partner. Right. Mm -hmm. Before he did not, he didn't understand his covenant. Mm -hmm. He didn't see the covenant. Mm -hmm. And so he went through what, how many chapters did we say? 40 chapters yeah, 40 and nine chapters, months yeah. of th stuff that should not have happened. But because he's first, number one, he started it off in fear with offering those sacrifices every day, every day, and not standing. But on see, that's his all covenant. he heard to do, though. Yeah, that was the only thing he knew how to do mm -hmm. was sacrifice. He didn't understand his covenant, that mm -hmm. that sacrifice was part of the covenant. And right. if he had understood his covenant, you see. But Understand look at the people that go your covenant. through. Oh, go through the rituals. Yes. That, I mean, yes. that's what's in my mind understand. now. I think to go through the rituals and they don't understand right. the, the ramifications right. of what that means. But they, they right. we were talking about taking communion mm -hmm. frivolously yep. and not preparing the heart yes. and not doing. And, and so actually we are blaspheming, mm -hmm. <clears throat> dishonoring. By by yeah, our yeah. covenant by not doing yeah. and preparing ourselves. Yeah. But when yes. he finally saw God, when he finally had his eyes open, yeah. when we finally have that relationship with God, we know of Him. But it takes eight; those eighteen inches <laughs> are the, the head longest to the heart. Yeah. from the head to the heart. We know, yeah. mm -hmm. but then all of a sudden we know. Yeah. But we know we know. You have to understand mm -hmm. the covenant. You have to understand that God is a covenant-keeping right. God. He does everything through covenant. Mm -hmm. You don't receive anything from God apart from covenant, being in covenant with him. Now, like I said, this covenant is not our covenant. This covenant was between Job and God. Mm -hmm. It didn't even include anyone else. It was just between Job and God. In chapter 42, verse 10, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Mm -hmm. How's that for prosperity message? Mm. <laughs> Our covenant God, when the covenant partner uh, talked to him about his friends, about the people in his yeah. life, the covenant partner God healed his friends, took care of his friends, and blessed him double. Double for his trouble. And I wonder if that's where that saying came from. Double for your trouble. <laughs> you have covenant rights. Stand on them. In verse uh, 4, let's see. In the Amplified. Yeah. Okay, 42.4. I had virtually said to you, what you have said to me. Here I beseech you, and I will speak. I will demand of you, and you declare to me. My prayer out of this whole thing about Job is, covenant partner God, tell me what to say, and I'll say it. What's the part of the covenant that you want me to declare today over my body, over over whatever is illness or, or symptoms have come on my body? What word do you have for me today to speak? I will declare it and you will answer. Next week, we're going to discuss the covenant that we do live under, which is Abraham's modified covenant. Any comments or anything else you want to say about Job's covenant? Well, that's interesting because that does put a different slant on Job for sure, for me anyway, um, you know, from just reading the book mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. me too um, yeah it's um no oh, praise god holy spirit's yeah. doing what he what we asked him to do mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. because before it was always joe went through all this stuff and he and then he what i want to say he stayed until the end i mean god mm -hmm. blessed him in the end but it i've not really been taught about the covenant part of it no because mm -hmm. that's where job was always thought god why did you test him like that but it's because he wasn't doing the covenant sure he wasn't standing mm -hmm. he didn't understand he was um actually he didn't really trust god because mm -hmm. he was doing the the sacrifices every day and worried about his kids and this and this and this. Whereas he did understand his covenant. And that puts a whole different slant. 
<laughs> I mean, he, he was a righteous man. Here are some hindrances to receiving healing. We'll see how many we can get through here today. Number one hindrance, and I had never heard this before, but because Hezekiah used a poultice, poultice that means that God's not going to heal me. Let's look at this. It's, so I, in my Bible, I have under the, the heading is Hezekiah's sickness. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. About that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill, and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to visit him. He gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you are going to die. You will not recover from this illness. When Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I have always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. Then this message came to Isaiah from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah and tell him, This is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will rescue you and this city from the king of Assyria. Yes, I will defend this city. Okay, and then would you skip over to verse 20 and 21? Think of it. The Lord is ready to heal me. I will sing his praises with instruments every day of my life in the temple of the Lord. Isaiah had said to Hezekiah's servants, make an ointment from figs and spread it over the boil and Hezekiah will recover. So God had already told Hezekiah that he wouldn't die for 15 more years. So this thing, this thing that um, Isaiah told him to do wasn't necessary for his healing. It wasn't necessary as medicine. It had no curing power in it. What was it in your Bible ointment. that it was called? Ointment. ointment. How is ointment going to heal uh, boils? It had nothing in it. But sometimes it takes an act of obedience to release your faith. Just like, uh, remember Naaman the leper who had to dip in the Jordan River seven times and he got a little upset and said, I thought he would at least come out and talk to me. And he didn't. But he had to take that step of obedience and go down to the Jordan the, the Jordan mud didn't have any type of power to heal anymore, any, any more than that ointment had to heal Hezekiah. It was obedience mm -hmm. and faith, and that's what our Father is looking for. Sometimes when people come up to the altar, the minister will ask them to do something that they couldn't do before coming down. They are looking for obedience and faith in God. It doesn't mean that everyone coming down to do what that person was told to do. Mm -hmm. You do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. He's look, God is looking for obedience and faith. So you can release your faith in the covenant that you have. When you know what the blood covenant has provided for you through Jesus, you'll do what he tells you to do with faith in the blood, not in the instruction, other than it's what God said for you to do. It's going to be different for every person. Some people are, God's going to say, okay, go to the doctor and find out what the problem is. Mm -hmm. Some people, God's going to say, just trust me. What is God saying to you to do? And don't let anyone else or their experience determine what you, your obedience will be. The second, oh, do you, do you have any questions or comments, questions on Hezekiah? The second one is, the reason I'm not healed is because Paul left Trophimus sick at, at Mildum. So, you know, he left some, Paul. He's an apostle. He left someone sick. He didn't heal him. So why would he heal me? Let's look at 2 Timothy 4.20. says, this is Paul talking to Timothy. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. It's right there. Yep, happened. It says that. Trophimus's faith played a part in the healing. No matter how much faith the praying person has, the effects of an individual's doubt will nullify that praying person's faith. So if you're praying for someone who has doubt, 
Your faith will not override their doubt. Even Jesus couldn't get everyone healed because of their unbelief. So Paul, perhaps, when he prayed for Trophimus, he had the faith and the power was there to heal him. But Trophimus may not have had the faith. He had, to, he had doubt. And you know what James says, if you doubt, you're not going to get anything. In Mark 6, verses 1 through 6, he went away from there and came to his hometown. And I think we're talking about Jesus. Yes. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and uh, Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Jesus, the Son of God, <laughs> could not heal uh -uh. some people, except maybe somebody with a headache or a toothache or something. Verse 6, he says he couldn't do it because of unbelief. unbelief. And if you notice, I, I was just noticing this in verse 2, that the people heard him. They had ears to hear. Remember, we're talking about the rocky ground. Mm -hmm. They had ears to hear. But they said, where does this man get these things from? I Talk about disrespect. This, What wisdom is this? which he has has been given to him how is he able to do that he's just a carpenter we know who he is he's he's nothing doubt unbelief god would not override their unbelief yes he was the son of god yes he could have done it he's sovereign yeah but he gave us a will and a mind you are going to have to decide what you're going to do and what you're going to believe and then don't blame it on Trophimus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just because some don't get healed doesn't mean that it's not God's will that they be healed. Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. I stand on that one. Yep. I yep. That's, and you know what? If you think about it, Jesus never sent his disciples out. They were two always two. two, and I two by two, and and this is why I think you, you have to have two: one to agree, mm -hmm. and one to pray for the other one. Why? Wow. Or yeah. yes, I agree with that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, what if it's just you and another person, and you're praying about something? You think you're in agreement. But obviously, Trophimus was not in he agreement. He was not with in Paul. agreement. So you have to have that. that yeah. You have to have that. Mm -hmm. If you don't agree with the person praying, it will not happen. That's right. Your faith plays a part in your healing. So mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of times that's why um, some preachers do a lot of teaching on a certain top topic. Because if the people don't know, they can't, when they go down to the altar, they still got this doubt and unbelief in their mind and they're being mm -hmm. prayed for and nothing happens. And nothing happens. Because they still they're relying on the faith yeah. of a person praying for them yeah. rather than having to accept it. Mm -hmm. It's my faith that yeah. heals me. And although doing that is okay when you're a baby, mm. baby Christian, or not a Christian, you can rely on someone else's faith. But once you, you know Jesus... Well, that's the milk. Yeah, that's right. That's the milk. He tells us to grow, grow up, and be, up and be a meat Christian. Yeah. That means we take the authority. We take. Yeah. We stand yeah. on our covenant. That's right. Yeah. Let's do a real quick review on um, healings versus miracles. Remember, mm -hmm. miracles involve involving healing are instantaneous healings. Right. Other healings are gradual. Let's look at John 4, verses 46 through 53. This is the healing of the nobleman's son. 
As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son who was about to die. Jesus asked, Will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? The official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Then Jesus told him, go back home, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. While the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better and they replied, yesterday afternoon at one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Then the father realized that this was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. The boy began to mend from that hour. It doesn't say it was instantaneous. Mm -hmm. He began to mend. And this just comes to my That's mind true. is they in Mark it says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Remember the word recover mm -hmm. is not instantaneous. Mm -hmm. It begins to mend. Perhaps Trophimus's, oh, that's hard to say, Trophimus's <laughs> healing was on the way. It may have looked like he wasn't healed on the outside, but it was working on the inside of him. Gradual healings are often greater than instant healings because some people who are quickly healed forget God. Those gradually healed continue to stand on God's word and develop strong faith. So here's another way of looking at Trophimus is not being healed, supposedly. We don't know because there is no follow-up to this, no follow-up letter, whatever. But it's working on the inside. Remember the, um, the fig tree? It dried mm -hmm. up from the roots. From you the couldn't roots, see yeah. the roots, but it was dying from the roots. The yeah. longer you stand on your covenant, the more firm and convinced you are about your covenant. This this covenant, this, this word mm -hmm. of God has the power in itself to bring itself to pass. Mm -hmm. It's anointed. Mm -hmm. There's such an anointing on this covenant here that when you keep standing on it and standing on it, eventually that anointing is going to build up inside of you and it's going to bring the healing. Mm -hmm. Have you heard this one? I'm suffering for the glory of God. Oh, yes. Pride. Huh? <laughs> well, I am so special. That I am suffering for God's glory. Haven't heard that one. <laughs> oh, yes. It's a big one. Let's look at John 9, 1 through 4. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night comes when no man can work. People say that because of this story, they are suffering so that God will give glory. Um, does it say anything in there about suffering for the glory? It's, they asked him about um, who sinned. Well, how's, how's that got anything to do with God giving glory? However, God's works, which were mentioned in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me, weren't shown until the blind man was healed. Jesus was referring to healing, not to blindness or sickness or sin. He was referring to God's glory happening as a result of the healing. God doesn't get glory in your sickness. He gets glory when you are healed. When you are healed. When it happens. You continue to give him praise. You continue to worship him through whatever you're going through, through your healing process. You continue to praise him, you continue to worship him. Do not complain or you'll stay in your condition for 40 years. <laughs> worship. What about Lazarus? Does, doesn't the Bible say that he was sick for the glory of God? Let's look at that. John 11, just a couple of chapters over. Verse 4. When Jesus heard, um, this was the sisters came and told them, told him that Lazarus was sick. 
He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. If you'll believe, you'll see God's glory is what he says in verse um, 24 to 26. He's talking to Martha. Martha said, I know that I, he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall, shall never die. Do you believe? And then in verse 40, he said, Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you? If you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Believing brought about the glory of God. Martha had not yet seen God's glory. It wasn't shown yet. It was shown when Lazarus was resurrected and healed. God is glorified through healing and deliverance, not sickness and suffering. He had to be healed when he came out. Otherwise, he would have died again. <laughs> he was healed when he was resurrected. You know, there's a curious thing on that. Um, when Jesus um, resurrected, he says, come forth. He cried. Mm -hmm. Why did Jesus cry? This, this is this is very interesting. And to me, I, I've thought about that. Why was why did Jesus cry um, when Lazarus was resurrected? Because he knew, to my opinion, the way mm -hmm. I've, I've resolved in my mind, Lazarus was already home in heaven, and Jesus was sad because he had to, to bring him back, back <laughs> for Lazarus to have to die again. I thought about, you know, I, that was because you don't hear, read or, or know of Jesus weeping or being sad necessarily. Mm -hmm. he, he had brought so much, you know, love and joy and peace and whatever, but he came to bring strife because he said, you know, yeah. you're going to be against me. And But, yeah, he knew what La where Lazarus was. He was going to have to die again, but he also... Um, it says later on that the Pharisees not only were now trying to kill Jesus, they were trying to kill Lazarus, Lazarus because well. of his mm -hmm. his testimony, because right. of the glory of God that came right. as a result of him being healed. Because he could tell about heaven. Heaven. He well, could have told him. Yeah. We don't know that. Yeah. But paradise. Yeah. Paradise. He could. Well, yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. It the was goodness. Paradise. But the, the fact that there really is mm -hmm. a, a life beyond death. Right. He wasn't the first one to to no. die. I mean, that um, that girl died and the son died. Um, there was a, um, the girl, Jesus went in and took Jarius her hand. Jarius' daughter. And, yeah, raised, yeah. Jarius' daughter. And the well, other one we read about the son that, mm -hmm. that died, but he started healing and, yeah. But Lazarus was already there. Yes. And had been for several days. Yeah, four days. So, um, yeah, it had to be four because yes. they, they believed people could come back. After three. Uh, after three. Uh, yeah. Up to three. Yeah. But after three, you know, you sneak it. <laughs> so, um, so Jesus waited particularly because that squashed that, that theory that came to mind because yeah. that, and that was a miracle bringing him back. Mm -hmm. But then it was a miracle what, because he could tell. And and he, how many people testimony. were affected by yeah. Lazarus's testimony? They wouldn't have been today. trying to kill him if they if, if he wasn't right. testifying. Right. All right. Our last one for today: sickness is God's chastening, or mm -hmm. God's teaching me something, or all these people were were affected as a result of my being sick. So it's a good thing, really. Mm -hmm. Hebrews twelve six: For the Lord disciplines those He loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Right? That's right. That's what it says. Yeah. Okay, for the Lord disciplines. Mm -hmm. And and I know, I know <laughs> he disciplines. <laughs> I've been there and done that. I know that he does discipline. But as you see it in, in, in time when you're looking back over how he disciplined you, you can see how blessed you were because of it. Does it say anything anywhere in what you read about sickness? No. Nope. No, it doesn't, does it? Mm -mm. Not a single thing is said there about sickness. Mm -mm. He is a good father. He is a very good he, father. That you would not, if you had children, put sickness on your child to teach him something. Mm -hmm. So there's no sickness mentioned here. Chasten literally means to child train, to educate, or to teach. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? (laughs) Yeah, God gives good Good gifts to his children to teach them. Yeah. James 1, 17. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good gift comes from God, not bad gifts. Are there bad gifts? Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. God's with us too. What are we doing? Are you doing good? Are you healing people that are in your life? Especially those that are oppressed by the devil. Are you laying hands on them and believing in faith? Jesus always did good. Jesus said in John 16 verses 12 through 15. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Classic. I have still many things to say to you, Jesus is talking to his disciples, but you are not able to bear them or to take them upon you or to grasp them now. It was like where we started off at the beginning. They didn't have ears to hear. They didn't have the, they might've had stony ground or it hadn't been tilled up yet to receive what he had to say. But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the whole full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him, and he will announce and declare to you, declare, there it is, covenant, declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will honor and glorify me. That's where God gets glory. Because he will take, uh, receive, draw upon what is mine and will reveal, declare, disclose, transmit it, to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. That is what I meant when I said that he, the Spirit, will take the things that are mine and reveal, declare, disclose, transmit it to you. Holy Spirit is our teacher. And you know what just opened up to me when I'm, while you're saying that? They couldn't hear, they couldn't understand at that point in time. That's right. Look at a doctor. A doctor is being trained. A doctor goes into med school. He's starting basic foundation. He enters his first day of med school. He is just starting. He's not going to say, doctor, would you come in and do the surgery? Right. No, he, he doesn't. He doesn't have that knowledge. He hasn't been exposed to that. He doesn't know that yet. So like with, um, as a doctor takes steps, he learns um, physiology, he learns anatomy, he learns um, medicine, he, pharmacology, he learns surgical procedures. But each one is a, a, a lesson he's learned that he can apply. And I think that's what you and I are. God couldn't give us our, our assignment when we're younger Christians, not necessarily younger people, but younger Christians. He has to, to uh, rely on others that are older than we, that are more experienced, that they can teach us. And as we are, we receive one lesson <clears throat> Then we build on that lesson and build on that lesson and build on that lesson. So in time, we can do whatever surgical procedure that the Holy Spirit wants to us to perform. And that's laying on hands. That's by helping people receive Christ, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But we had to learn. Line by line. Line by line. Step yes. by step, he leads me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, no, they, they couldn't understand. They couldn't. He wanted to tell them, but he knows that he they will learn and as they are taught they will teach by the holy spirit by the holy spirit that's why we need <laughs> holy spirit not only we receive him yes we we receive mm-hmm. the fullness of the holy spirit when You're we accept jesus but mm-hmm. we need more of him Absolutely. so that he can teach us more that's where the baptism in the holy spirit comes in that's, that's right. where all these gifts that caleb is talking about on oh, sunday comes in so good he's every single so good. one of these gifts mm-hmm. need to be in our lives 
it, because you never know when you're going to need that gift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to desire all of them, but especially to prophesy, which is just to, to do what we're doing right here, right. to edify each other, to build each other up. So Holy Spirit is our teacher, and it says our last scripture for today, 1 John 2, 27. I'll read it first in the King James. Okay. But the anointing which you have received, so this is something you received at salvation. Uh, you received of him, it lives in you or abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall live or abide in him. The Amplified says, but as for you, the anointing, the sacred appointment, the unction, unction, which you have received from him abides permanently in you. So then you have no need that anyone should instruct you. But just as his anointing teaches you concerning everything, everything, what does everything mean? Oh. Everything. It's not just spiritual mm -hmm. things. You can, you can pray in tongues over a, a lesson that you're trying to learn in school. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're not getting it, that anointing, that unction in you will teach you everything. And it's true and it's no falsehood, so there's no lie. You must abide in, live in, never depart from him, being rooted in him, mm -hmm. knit to him, just as his anointing has taught you to live in him. What did Jesus say? Abide in me and my words abide in you. You shall ask whatever you will and it shall be given. Yeah. The anointing. The Holy Spirit is the giver of the anointing. But the anointing and the Holy Spirit live inside of us. And we can do everything through that anointing. Does that mean we don't need preachers and teachers anymore? Oh, no. <laughs> no. That doesn't say that. The preachers and teachers were given to us to encourage us, to edify us, to equip us. Mm -hmm. We need them. We need to listen to anointed preachers and teachers and evangelists and prophets and what's the other one? Apostles. They're there to teach us, to lead us, to help us, to encourage us, to be all that we can be and to know our covenant. The assignment for this week is Job 42.4. Pray about this. Tell me what to say, God, and I will say it. And then write down what he, what he tells you to say.